All right, everybody. Good day. It is October 1st, and we look today at Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, or as they probably pronounce his name in Italy, Malachi. So uh, the Italian prophet, I won't call him Malachi, but I'm half tempted to do that. We'll just call him Malachi. Let me read to you from the introduction to the Wesley Study Bible. The book of Malachi is a collection of prophecies delivered to the Jewish community, most likely in the 5th century BC after the first wave of exiles had rebuilt the temple under Haggai, Zechariah, Zerubbabel, and Joshua, and before Ezra and Nehemiah had arrived on the scene. One can discern a basic rhythm throughout the book. Each section begins with an introduction, asserting God's character or the people's action, cites words of the people that elicit the Lord's response and concludes with a command, warning, or promise prompted by the earlier elements. Malachi is dominated by the call to holiness, whether that is in worship practices, sacrifice, tithing, service, purity of priestly leadership, marriage relationships, divorced, mixed marriages, adultery, questioning God's inter intentions, love, justice, or social justice. Malachi 3.16 highlights the kind of response sought by the Lord, the reverent fear of the Lord, which reflects on God's name. The penitential response demanded in 3.7 is one which is designed to remedy the lack of adherence to God's commands, but does so by a call first to respond to a covenant partner. Return to me and I will return to you. Thus, while the prophetic calls for change dominate the book, Underlying such calls is the enduring love of the Lord for God's people. However, one cannot miss the expectation that the Lord's arrival will mean not only salvation for the reverent penitent, but also purging for the wicked. According to the New Testament, this emphasis on repentance preceding the powerful appearance of the Lord sets the scene for the arrival of the Messiah, Jesus an arrival prepared for by John the Baptist. And we will find that out in the Gospels when we get to it. All right, so, um, so you get a superscription in the book in verse one. It launches into the first of a series of six back and forth disputes. These interchanges which counter the people's lapsed faithfulness typically begin with a statement of God's perspective uh, turn to, they turn to quote the audience objections and then lay out a prophetic response. Renewing the covenant relationship with God is central to each dispute. Um, Malachi's first dispute insists that covenantal election uh, makes a real difference in history. In particular, no one can ignore that the land of Jacob's twin Esau now lies in ruin. The Babylonian emperor Nabonidus campaigned against Edom in 553 BC, and the Nabataeans were now overrunning it. The Esau's of the world, profane and without covenantal instruction, have no future. The Jacob's, in contrast, will benefit from the reign of God, uh, not through worth or merit, but due to God's call. With the advent of God's reign, God's People far and wide will worship God. The covenant's expansive goal will burst beyond the borders of Israel. Uh, at the beginning of the second dispute that starts in 1.6, Malachi rebukes his fellow priests for despising God's name. Their shoddy and defiling worship is degrading. Uh, God's uniquely chosen shrine where God's name dwells. They plead ignorance, but God's standard for sacrifice leave them without an excuse. In fact, a closed temple would be preferable to their lax, grudging service. God's imminent reign proves to be the ultimate reference point. Though contested at present, at present, God's reign offers a doxological truth, unmasking the audacity of lackadaisical worship. God is Lord from east to west. All around the world, sacrifice and pure oblation are about to be offered to God. The temple is now corrupt. Um, the priests practically stick up their noses at God. The cheap worship they conduct is a nuisance to them, 
and an open invitation for fraudulence among the populace. How can this be happening, given the truth that God inspires universal reference? In chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, Malachi reminds the priests of their special clerical covenant, which includes sanctions for unfaithfulness. You get to the shocking language about dung. Uh, eh, we translate it dung. It's probably more profane with that with another word in English, but we won't go there. You know what I'm talking about. It just personalizes the looming threat. Malachi argues that all priestly subgroups are bound by the covenant of Levi. Now, the uh, subgroups would be the Zadokites and the Aaronite priesthood, but it's the covenant with Levi that is critical. All are responsible for God's teaching, for teaching God's covenantal ways. Uh, the grim current reality could not contrast more sharply with Malachi's covenantal ideal. So beginning in chapter 2, verse 10, we get three examples of Judah's covenantal infidelity. Uh, this is the third dispute, and it confronts his audience with three specific examples of covenantal betrayal. First, he cites the betrayal of the covenant of Levi. How can the current vitriol between priests be acceptable given their one father? Second, Malachi spiritually cites mixed marriages uh, in which um, marrying foreigners was fine, but not devotees of a foreign god. So the issue here is not ethnicity. It is which god do they worship? And third, Malachi cites the affront of letting enmity break up a legitimate marriage. Um, and uh, Abraham, we get Abraham here as an example of covenant loyalty with Sarah, the wife of his youth. We get in chapter two, starting with verse 17, a new section, God's coming day that counters disillusion and uh, cynicism. Malachi's fourth dispute confronts disillusion at the day of God's justice. Observing an apparent triumph of evil, people felt defeated. Uh, judgment felt so unreal, some virtually dared God to punish their sins. The prophet fires back with a vision that is forged on. Um, and even now, God's messenger waits in the wings, ready to clear the way for God. Um, the loaded language assures readers that God's advent will result in a new exodus, renewing the people as God's special possession. The mission of the messenger is merely preparatory. There follows a momentous arrival of the Lord God's self in an epiphany that is a revelation. Uh, present despair of judgment ever arriving will vanish suddenly and a reverent fear of God washes over the land. At God's chosen shrine, all priests, no matter their lineage, will become ideal Levites. Their previous grudging manner, a casualty um, uh, for uh, with, that is compared to lye soap and heat that is so strong that it melts. The passage also announces the arrival of uh, this figure, the messenger of the covenant. Uh, he plays the mediatory role of Moses. Uh, he stands in for the people who must hide from God's numerous awe-inspiring revelation, and he trains the people in the covenant's structure for right living. And we Christians have seen this messenger uh, fulfilled as John the Baptist. And finally, you get a call to repentance in 3.6. Malachi's fifth uh, dispute urges a return to God. Uh, divine arms are open to receive the people back. He stresses because the God of the covenant does not change. And so because God is unwaveringly committed to his people, if the people repent, God will receive them. The people ask what they're supposed to do, and Malachi confronts them with their betrayal of temple worship. Uh, in Deuteronomy, spirituality, uh, in Deuteronomy's spirituality, the people's tithes and offerings in support of God's sanctuary honored God's singular claim on their lives and the integrity of the communal life under the covenant. If they would only start embracing God's claim in a wholehearted and uh, materially tangible way, Malachi argues they could resurrect the covenant, both economically and spiritually. 
And in chapter 313, we get Malachi's sixth and concluding dispute, and it counters the knee-jerk impatience with uh, Malachi's theology. People wanted the Sinai Covenant to be a prosperity gospel. Ooh, we, we have that today, don't we? Guaranteeing that each person will inevitably get ahead. They wanted a test that would box God, God in, forcing God to meet their terms and their timetable. But uh, some of his contemporaries are going to be disappointed. God's day of discrimination holds no threat for those who are God's fearing remnant. Uh, until that day when righteousness dawns upon them, they will embody God's covenantal purposes as God's special possession. And in verses four through six, the last verses of Malachi, uh, you get the drawing of Malachi's prophecy and the Bible's entire collection of the prophets to a close. They remind readers to attend both past and future. Deuteronomy 34, chapter uh, verses 10 through 12, concludes the Torah on a simi similar note. The Sinai experience will be foundational, but the covenant has a prophetic future. The revelation to Moses was definitive, but Moses was himself a prophet, and he had prophets as successors. Thus endeth the Old Testament. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for Malachi for his reinforcing of the great traditions of our faith, but also in his vision to look ahead as to what you may have planned for the future. And now as we prepare to move into that future, as we read the New Testament, we ask that we would be open to your spirit speaking to us in these days ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, we will start tomorrow in the New Testament and Matthew's Gospel. See you then.